I have a strong unction from God this morning to teach concerning what I absolutely know to be one of the greatest principles that you could ever grab a hold of as a disciple of Christ. It, it, no less than three, maybe even four or five times, this topic came up this week in various discussions, conversations that I had with different people. And with every conversation, it, it just grew in my spirit until I felt God strongly speaking to my heart to share this with you this morning. Matthew chapter 19, verse number 16 records a story in which at least to some degree every single person in this building this morning can relate to this story to some degree. It records, and behold, one came and said unto him, Good master. Somebody say good. His question was this, What good thing shall I do? Somebody say good. What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he, Jesus, said unto him, Why callest thou me good? Referring to the flesh. For there is none good but one. And that is God. Referring to the spirit that was in him. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And this good servant replied and said unto him, Which commandment? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, referring to, the, to, ten, to a few of the Ten Commandments. In verse 20, notice what he says. The young man saith unto him, All these have I kept from my youth up. I'm already doing these things. But then comes the important question. What lack I yet? I'm obeying the commandments. I'm obeying the word. But what am I lacking? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, he was already good. And a good man asked, what am I lacking? And Jesus said, well, since you asked, let me tell you. If you want to be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. He obeyed the commandments, was a good follower of the Old Testament law. But Jesus said, there's more to this thing than being good. There's another level. If you want to be perfect, this is what is required to be perfect. It's not what you do that causes you to be perfect. It's what you're willing to give up that causes you to be perfect. If you'll sell everything you have and give it to the poor. If you will shun what this world can offer you by material possessions. Then I know your spirit is right. And I can give you treasures in heaven. There's a difference between being good and being perfect. Jesus said, if you do this, if you want to be perfect, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And this is what it takes to be perfect. Once you've gotten rid of everything that's keeping you from being perfect, now come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful. For he had great possessions. Was a good man. 
had great possessions and what he had was more important, important to him than being perfect. It's a deep thought. I want to talk, I want to talk a little bit this morning concerning this because that mentality plagues the body of Christ in our generation. We're good. We're obeying the great majority of commandments. But there are some things that we are not willing to let go of so that we can be made perfect. We're content to be good, and that's good enough. But not with God. He said if you want to be perfect, if you want to be perfect, it's not enough to be good if you want to be perfect. Does that word scare you? I know some of y'all are sitting back there like, oh my God, what, what, perfect? We're scared to death. Sit down. You know the reason why the word perfect scares us? It's not because we don't want to be perfect. Everybody would like to be perfect. What scares us is, well, what if I step out there and start trying to be perfect and fail? What is everybody going to think about me at that point? See, the comfortable level is to be good, obey as many commandments as you can, but that leaves room for everybody to understand and make Foolish, ignorant, incorrect statements such as, well, when you fall, it's okay, you're only human. And many people want to dwell in that state of living because it is comfortable. I'm good. I'm obeying the majority of commandments. But there is another level. Perfect. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor right now and, and look him in the eye and say, did he really just say what I thought he said? We get shocked. You know why most Christians struggle with hypocrisy and lack of commitment, lack of dedication, lack of faithfulness. They're in, they're out, they're back, they're forth, they're up, they're down, they're wish-washy. You know why we have that problem? It's because we stagger at God's promise to perfect us. We don't really believe that we can walk perfect and blameless before God. We don't believe it. We, we, we live in a world of doubt. We'd like to be, but we have so much going on. We have things in our life that are not necessarily sins, but they are weights. Things that the Bible doesn't specifically name as sins, but yet that thing is keeping our spirit, our mentality, the way we think, the way we act, the way we pray, the way we minister, the way we witness, the way we live. It's hindering us on some level in our life. And God says, if you'll give me those things, if you'll sell those possessions, whatever it is that you as an individual are holding on to that is your comfort zone, your, your Snuggie, your, your baby blanket. What was the little boy in the your Linus that runs around with an old dirty, nasty blanket all the time? It's his most prized possession. You cannot pry it out of his hands. Many Christians are the same way. There are things, attitudes, concepts, mindsets that we are holding on to for dear life. Are we good? Yes. Are we good Christians? Sure. Are we obeying the great majority of the commandments? Absolutely. But being good is not being perfect. And he told the rich young ruler, you can be perfect if you're willing to pay the price. You've got to give me everything that you hold dear. And if you're willing, if there is nothing in this life 
that, that any mindset, any, any physical thing, any material possession, if there's nothing in this life that you refuse to let go of, and it's just you standing there, and you're willing to let go of everything else so that you might pursue me, if you've sold everything that you have, then you can come and follow me. That's the key to being perfect. Being perfect is not about knowledge. The Gnostics taught this, which the apostles battled hard even before they passed away. The Gnostics taught that you are saved by some mystical impartation of knowledge. The more you know, the more saved you are, essentially, in a nutshell, is what they taught. Knowledge doesn't save you. Paul said knowledge puffs up. If you're seeking knowledge for the sake of knowledge, you'll, you'll be, come into pride. And pride will cause you to be lost. God resists the proud. A proud look is an abomination to God. But if we gain knowledge for the purpose of changing our lives, we don't, we don't seek biblical knowledge for the sake of having biblical knowledge. We seek biblical knowledge for the sake of how to live. If we've not applied the knowledge, what have we accomplished? See, everybody seems and tends to think that what we're doing today is church. People can't see past church. Church is important. There, you, you, you can't be saved without going to church. People think, well, it's, it's a good thing to do. You need to go to church as much as you can. You'll be lost if you don't go to church. Um, I read it a couple of weeks ago. For those of you that missed it, write it down in your study guide so you can read it later. Hebrews 10, 25, and 26. The writer of Hebrews taught us, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. Verse 26 says, For, which links what he's saying now to what he just said, For... If we sin willfully, missing church is a choice which God considers sin. For if you sin willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But most people easy come, easy go, show up late, halfway through church. I guarantee you don't show up 30 minutes late for work every day. But the things of God are not as important as the things of the world. And that paycheck is important, so I'll be there. See, that kind of mentality is is how people look at the church. Well, it's church. It's not church. Church is not the end result. Church is not the goal. Church is the means to an end. The end is God. Everything we do in this building is not just about having church, being the church. The church is the means to an end. The end is that we be perfect. Everything we do in the church, praying, Bible studies, teaching, the gifts of the Spirit, all of these things, which I'm going to show you in Scripture in a minute, all of these things are for one end goal. That every person in here become perfect before God. People think I could come sit on a church pew and just show up some, you know, praise, worship, do my part. That's what church is about. No, that's not what church church is about. Church is about perfecting you. That's why people can go to church for 30 years. They have that mentality, that mentality of church. And they can go to church for 30 years, have the same old nasty, cantankerous attitude, same old hypocritical ways, because they go and sit on church pews, and to them it's church. It ain't about, this is God's way of perfecting me. There ought to be some change in my life. Does it make sense? Watch this. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 1, it's in your study guide. The writer of Hebrews said, Therefore, 
leaving the principles or the beginning things, the, the foundational issues, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ or doctrine of Christ. There's only one. It covers many topics, but there's only one teaching of Christ. He says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to what? See, many people think that when we got the principles, that's all there is to achieve. You just got, you just got to understand the principles. You got to understand. He goes through them in the next few verses. The oneness of God, the doctrine of baptisms, water baptism, spirit baptism, the doctrine of the resurrection from the dead, so on and so forth. He names these principal elementary things you learned in kindergarten concerning Christ. The beginning, the principle, the foundational things. But notice what the writer says. The writer is saying, don't just stay at the principles of the doctrine of Christ. At some point, we all need to be leaving the principles. Now, when I say leaving, that doesn't mean forsaking the principles. That means it's, it's not a moving away from, it's a building on top of. It's not a moving this way, it's a moving this way. It's a growing up. As the principal issues are the foundation, you build one level on top of that, then another, then another, then another, then another, until it becomes an exceeding great building, an edifice. We are the house of God. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost to be built up into him in our most holy faith. We are not a physical edifice, but we are become the edifice, the temple of God, which he dwells in. And therefore, after we've laid the strong foundation of these foundational doctrines, now he desires for us to go on unto perfection. That's why we preach and teach the way we do around here. When you come here, you're probably not going to sit through too many services around here that we don't preach against something. We're going to step on somebody's toes about some sort of issue. Issues from A to Z and back and forth and in between, everything in between. We're going to hit it, something, every service. You know why? Because the goal of this church is not to gather a bunch of people and say, wow, what a church we've got. What good has that done anybody? But the reason we preach the way, the teach the way we do, is because we understand the goal of the church is not church. The goal of the church is perfection. Does that make sense? Colossians chapter 1 verse 26. Notice what Paul writes to the saints at the church in Colossae. <clears throat> Even the mystery, somebody say the mystery. Not everybody knows, if it's a mystery, that means everybody don't know it. It's a mystery. Some people may know it, but the great majority do not, else it's not really a mystery. Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory. He declares, Paul declares that the will of God is that his people know the riches of his glory. Now, the young, rich young ruler that we read about initially knew God's commandments, but he didn't know his riches. Jesus said, you got to sell what you have in this life and I'll give you treasures of heaven. The, the good follower of the Old Testament, the believer in Jesus, knew the commandments. But knowing the commandments and knowing the riches, the mysteries of his glory are two completely different things. And he says, God, God desires to make known what is the riches of his glory, of this mystery among the Gentiles. Somebody say, that's us. Which is, now here's the mystery. There's a lot too more, more to it than this statement. But in a nutshell, this is what it is. Which is Christ in you. 
the hope of glory. Paul made a statement <clears throat> concerning believers. He said that he was praying, praying for them till Christ be formed in you. Travailing again until Christ be formed in you. That speaks to me of a process. Everybody talking about, I received Christ, I received Christ. Well, if you receive Christ, I ought to be seeing a little bit of Christ in your life. If you received Christ, I ought to be able to look at your life and, and see God living through you. Christ in you. Now, everybody wants to name Christ. That's why the apostles all the time, you find it everywhere in the epistles. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You got to get rid of some things. That's what a true Christian is. A true Christian's goal is to continue to allow the word of God, the teaching, the preaching, the ministry of the spirit, the spirit moving on your intuition and your conscience, which we've talked about plenty in the past couple of months. Through those processes, Christ is formed in you. He's in you, but he's got to be formed. You've received the spirit, but are you walking In the spirit. It ain't enough to talk in tongues. That's just the start. You haven't even started till you talk in tongues. But it don't stop with that. Yet many people get content. Talked in tongues one time. I'm saved. I'm ready to go. I just show up at church every chance I get. But never do change. Never do mature. Never do grow. Ain't anywhere close to being perfected. And don't even care less. In fact, are comfortable with where they're at. I'm good. I'm good. I don't need anything. I'm good. I'm obeying most of the commandments. I'm showing up at church every chance I get. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm good. But we never ask the question like the rich young ruler because that's the key. What do I lack? I'm doing these good things. I'm pretty much a good Christian. What am I lacking? It's what you lack that separates the good from the perfect. <clears throat> Give me verse 28, please, sir. Now notice, Paul said the mystery is that Christ is in you. Everybody comfortable with what that means? It's not enough to have received Christ. i got to live out the ways of Christ. We'll talk a little bit more about that, so everybody's got a, a good picture of that. Now notice, Paul. now Paul refers to himself. He says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul said, that's whom I'm preaching. The reason I came to you was to preach this mystery. Christ in you. Whom we preach. Now, notice what happens here. Notice the dynamic. Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Paul said, our entire goal for coming to you was not only to just tell you, well, Christ died for your sins, that's good enough. He said, we came to tell you Christ died for your sins, receive him. You receive him by receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which is what they taught consistently through the, the, through the epistles. And he said, we preached Christ, we've tried to reveal this mystery to you. Here's how we did it, we warned you. Whom we preach... Hooping. <laughs> Whom we preach so that we get everybody worked up in such an emotional fit and people are dancing and shouting and will cuss you out before they hit the church parking lot. 
You get them home an hour later, they can't even remember what the sermon was about. Oh my God, he preached tonight. I dare you to ask him what he preached. Because the great majority would tell you, uh, what did he preach? I don't know, but it was good. It may have been good, but it won't perfect. God, teach us to know the difference between being good and being perfect. Paul said when we came preaching Christ, we came warning you. What is a warning? A warning is you better not do that. If you do that, this is going to happen. I'm warning you. See, everybody considers warning judgment today. If you warn somebody, you've judged them. Paul said, we've, warned, we've warned, every, warned every man and teaching every man. We've presented unto you wisdom, the wisdom that God had revealed to them. They revealed to the saints. That's the process he's saying. We want you to have this mystery. The reason we do this is that we may present every man. Say it. I know half of you are scared to say the word. Perfect. Perfect. Spit it out. It's in the Bible. Don't be scared of it. That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, what exactly does the Bible mean by perfect? Surely it doesn't mean perfect. Surely there's some sort of deep Greek understanding Look at Matthew 5, verse 48. This is what Jesus said about being perfect. He tells his disciples, be ye therefore perfect. How perfect? How perfect? Yeah, when, when it says perfect, that's what it means. Even as perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, that's a high standard to live up to. I'm not arguing with anybody on that point. That is a high standard to live up to. What I am arguing is the fact that it is, it is possible. See, most churches tell you it's not possible. You're human. You're going to sin. That's not what your Bible teaches you. Why would Jesus give you a commandment that it is impossible for you to obey? Why would he tell you you've got to be as perfect as God in heaven is perfect, as the Father in heaven is perfect? You've got to be that perfect. Why would he tell me that if it's impossible for me to do it? He's not a God that plays that kind of mind games. If he said it, he meant it. The reason why it seems so impossible to people is because they don't even understand the concept of what it means to really live for God. They understand the concept of church, but they don't understand. You you get people outside of this setting right here. See, everybody's all nice, holy looking, reserved, pious looking. But I, I would dare say, Get you somewhere Monday morning, some of you Friday night. <clears throat> it ain't quite the same thing going on Friday night as it is on Sunday morning. And people look at church, 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 church. It's church is a means to an end. The goal is to be perfect every day, no matter who you're around. No matter who you're with, no matter what circumstances present themselves to you, circumstances do not change the commandments and the principles of the word of God. Be ye perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. They struggle with this because they don't understand how to be perfect. We talked about 11 hours worth of teaching on how to be perfect few months ago spirit soul and body series if you've not listened to, if you did listen to it listen to it again 
Get those principles in your heart because we teach you how on a practical, everyday basis, how you can walk perfect before God. Because there are some secrets to this. Nobody's just going to step right off. Well, I see it now. Wow, he told me be perfect, so I'm going to go out and I'm going to be perfect. But you ain't learned how to walk in the Spirit. How are you going to be perfect and you don't even know what it really means to walk in the Spirit? So, today, I'm not going to hit a lot of those issues. I want to deal with our mindset concerning perfection. So, if, if, and he does, God demands that we be perfect, even as our Father which is in heaven is perfect, that begs the question, how do we become perfect? Just as perfect as he is. There's got to be a process, right? How do we become perfect? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And he, Jesus, Jesus gave these. Not people giving these to, to people. Jesus gave these. Jesus, these gifts come from God, not from man. That's where we miss it. Ephesians 4 and 11, and he gave, Jesus gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why did he give these gifts? For the what? For the perfecting of the saints. That's God's plan to get the church perfected no wonder the great majority of your churches are in such turmoil and uproar and chaos all kinds of foolishness going on in the body of Christ you know why because they're not operating with the gifts apostles prophets evangelists pastors and teachers how can you have a perfect church and you refuse to let these gifts operate Because this is God's plan. This is God's plan to bring perfection to the church. If you don't have these ministries in your life, you cannot be perfect. How are you going to become perfect and you're not even doing it God's way? See, our, our generation has put one man in a pulpit who thinks he is an apostle and a prophet and an evangelist and a pastor and a teacher and he is God's gift to the body of Christ and you don't need nobody else but him. So the problem is you can't get any more perfect sitting under him than he is. And if he thinks of himself in that nature, he ain't nowhere close to perfect. So this is God's way. Don't raise your hand, but just just think in your own mind. How many of you have been taught previously that there are no modern day apostles? Don't dare say if I asked for a show of hands, it'd be a great majority. Write this one down in your in your study guide. First Corinthians chapter twelve, towards the end. Give me, give me the end. I, I, I can't remember exactly which verse it is. 28. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God hath set some in the church. Who set them? God set them. The problem with our mentality is we think, well, if I have a problem with them, I'm just going to go somewhere else. So you're telling me you set your spiritual leadership over you. Because if you're moving around, God didn't set them. You're setting them. God's plan is God hath set some in the church. First, apostles. So if God set some in the church, then that means God's church has apostles, secondarily prophets, 
Thirdly, teachers. Then he goes into other various gifts. Now, here's a big way to tell if you're in God's church or somebody else's church. God's church has apostles, prophets, teachers, and many of the operation of the gifts. If your church don't have these, you're not in God's church. You're in somebody else's church. Let me get back. I've got to hurry. Ephesians, back to Ephesians 4 and 12. He gave these gifts for, for a purpose, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up, which we mentioned a while ago, the building up of the body of Christ. Now, the ministry, the fivefold ministry is going to operate until this point. See, everybody said, well, there are no more apostles. There are no more prophets. Well, that means then the church is already perfected. Because Paul said these gifts are going to operate. Give me 13. These gifts are going to operate till we all come in the unity of the faith. Until we're all there, we still need all these gifts operating in our lives. Fivefold ministry will continue to operate till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Now, the fivefold ministry will always operate unto a, the church must come to a perfect man. How perfect? Surely that doesn't mean perfect. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure, here's how you tell how perfect you are. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of that perfect. Until the church becomes as perfect as Christ was. See, we didn't even believe that was possible. But yet the apostles are pushing for it. It's the reason we came. That's the reason we preach Christ. Is that we may present you unto God a perfect man. Till we all come to the unity of what? How many faith? Well, you just believe what you believe and I'll believe what we all believe. And we all go end up in heaven together. There ain't but one faith. If you're believing something different than I'm believing, one of us is wrong. One of us is not in the faith. And the knowledge of the Son of God unto a, say it, say it. I just want to hear you say it. If you can say it, I know we're well on our way to beginning to believing it. Perfect. Unto a perfect man, unto the measure, as perfect. Here's how we measure our perfection till we get to the stature of the fullness of Christ. Does it make sense now why we preach so hard? Why we warn every man every time we come together? Does it make sense? We're not here just to try to build church growth. That's the foolish, I hate that mess. Church growth. That's stupid. Can no man make God's church grow? That's where people have deviated from being a part of God's church to having their own church. Because they think through their carnal methods, through letting down on the word of God, they can bring more people into the church. If you do bring them in, you haven't brought them into God's church until they're walking according to God's word. You ain't got nothing but a glorified Christian country club. And I use the term Christian loosely. Interesting, isn't it? Now, if that's how God's chosen us, and I'll come back to it in a moment. I'm trying to hurry. I'm trying to stay under an hour today. I really am. Y'all pray for me. <laughs> if God wants us to be perfect, and he has given us the structure that we need to receive the process of perfection in our life, then what does the process of perfection look like? Jesus covered that as well. John chapter 15 verse 1. Jesus speaking, he said, I am the true vine. 
And my father is the husbandman. The flesh is the vine. The spirit is the cultivator of the vine. That's what Jesus was saying to the rich young ruler. Don't call the flesh good. The spirit is the only thing that's good. You can't be perfect without walking in the spirit. So it's not flesh that produces perfection. It's the spirit moving on the flesh that produces perfection. I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. It means if you are not producing fruit, what fruit? Best, best place to find out what the fruit is, Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, so on and so forth. If you're not producing these fruit, Jesus said he cut you off. That's what happens when people backslide. They forget I'm supposed to be producing these fruit every day of my life. And they lose that focus on the, in their everyday life. So they don't pray about it. They don't study. They don't work on themselves. They don't allow people to come in and tell them, hey, you need to step it up in this area. Because they're not even trying to step it up in that area. They want to act like they're already completely, I'm good. I don't need anything else. So when, somebody, when the five-fold ministry steps in and says, hey, you need to step it up in this area a little bit, they're like, don't tell me what to do. Don't judge me. When you make the statement, don't judge me, you've just pronounced a statement of never being able to be perfected. You have condemned yourself to never be perfected. And people do it all the time. People leave our church all the time. Y'all preach too hard. I had one lady said, y'all are stronger Christians than I am. I just, it convicts me to be around y'all. And I was thinking... How? So you're going to find some watered down, broke back mountain church to fit in with a bunch of soft shelled people calling themselves Christians but who are not really Christians. And you'd rather sit in with them than to have your, your toes stepped on when you come to a real church that's trying to make you like God. You have just pronounced judgment on yourself that you've said the will of God will not be done in my life. It is his will to perfect me and I refuse to be perfected. Too much conviction involved. You've judged yourself. I didn't judge you. I was warning you. You judged yourself. Notice, i got to hurry. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. He'll do it. He'll cut you off. He'll cut you off and you not even know you cut off. You in here talking in tongues, cut off and don't even know it. Shouting, dancing, prophesying, prophelying. Oh, that saith the Lord, you're going to get a new car. No, you ain't. That's a lie. been cut off and don't even realize he's cut you off because you refused to bear the fruit of perfection and every now notice this I got to get this and because I know these people are not here today <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to preach to the people that are here and every branch that beareth fruit somebody say that's good you bared fruit. You got some good things going on in God. Now notice what's going to happen. Now that you've become good, every branch that beareth fruit, he does what? He starts cutting things out of your life. But I thought I was good. I'm not committing adultery. I'm praying some. I'm going to church some. I'm not killing anybody. I'm good. Now he starts, once that you've bared a little bit of fruit, now he starts purging you. He will cut away at this and snip away at that. Purging is a painful process for the bush. He 
he purgeth it. Once you start bearing a little fruit, now, he, now that you're good, now he's going to start working on perfecting you. But most people, once they get here and he starts this, they get offended. But I thought I was good. If I was good, why would God let this happen to me? The reason it's happening is because you were good. Now, he wants you to be perfect. Does it make sense? If you are a Christian and you are truly desiring to live your life for God, everything, capital E, everything that happens to you is in God's plan. Everything. Sickness. Family problems, financial struggles. Paul said all things work together for good to them. Not too good for them. That's the way most people believe it. He said it's, it's for good to you. How many of you know that not all things that are good for you are good to you? Two completely different things. Purging you is not good for for you, it's good to you. It cuts out the weights that are keeping you from being perfect. Everything. All things. He purged it. That, here's the reason why. That it may bring forth. Ah, he's not satisfied with you being good. He wants you to be That's why he's working on you so diligently through every test, through every trial, through every sermon, through every Bible study, through every prayer session you have with God. He's purging. He's perfecting. If you feel convicted, you better thank your God that he loved you enough. Where would Jonah have been if God hadn't purged him by putting him in the belly of a whale for three days? Jonah better thank God for the whale. Because if the whale hadn't have been there, Jonah would have lived in rebellion all the rest of his days and been cut off from God. But God had enough mercy on Jonah to correct him in the belly of a whale. And people today are running from correction. Don't judge me. Y'all are too legalistic around that church. Please. You don't even understand your God making statements like that. You don't even know who you're trying to live for. The God you serve when you bear fruit will purge you that you may bring forth more fruit. Now, verse 3, how, what is this purging process? What is this cleansing process? Verse 3, now ye are clean through, through what? The word. That's where ministry comes back into play. The preaching, teaching of the principles of the word of God cleanses, purges, perfects you. And yet that's the very thing people don't want in this generation. Teach me how to be rich. But don't teach me how to be loving and kind and patient and temperate, self-controlled. Don't tell me those things. Don't judge me. Notice verse 7. Jesus said, if. Everybody say if. That's a contingency. If ye abide in me. And what? My words abide in you. Now, the, the preacher is going to bring forth the word of God. But now you've got to decide, is this word going to be like water off a duck's back? Or am I going to open my mouth wide, regardless of if it tastes good or not, and swallow my medicine and allow the word to cleanse me? That's the decision every individual has to make. But he says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye sh don't everybody in the world, everybody in their brother quotes this scripture right here. I'm going to ask what I will. 
and it shall be done unto me. And you, his word ain't nowhere near you. Every time God spoke the word, you rejected it. You ran away from it. And quoting scriptures, I'm going to ask what I will in it. The problem is most people today don't want to be perfected. It's bottom line, we, we don't want it. That's why we fight and kick and resist it so much. Is we want to be good, just good enough to slide into heaven by the hair of our chinny chin chin. When your God, his whole purpose for your life was once you get good, that's when the real Christianity actually starts. His goal is for you to be perfected. But most people, they don't want to be perfected. They want to be comforted. Pastor, you, you need to preach more encouraging sermons. Why don't you preach more about the positive things of the word of God? You guys are so negative over there. Again, statements like that, ignorantly, they have passed judgment on them, their own lives. They will never be perfected. Never. Encouragement does not perfect you. Rebuke perfects you. Reproof perfects you. But that's the last thing most Christians want. They'll flock by the thousands to the guy telling them how to get rich. Speaking the word of faith. We don't need a word of faith. We need a word of faithfulness. Because if we were more faithful, the, the fruit of faith would be so much easier manifested in our lives. I'll give you that for free. I won't charge you nothing. Now, interesting. You guys okay? I got six and a half minutes left before the hour's up. <clears throat> I'm going to try to finish this. Who's the teacher in this situation? When we're being perfected, who's the teacher? Because some of you are like, when I started talking about apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, you were thinking about that cuckoo guy you grew up with that ran off with the secretary and did all kinds of foolishness. And so now you're mad at every preacher that ever calls himself a man of God. We are not all the same. I promise you, my hand before God. Not every man of God is a crook. Not every man is still in the church money and running off with the women in the church or in these days running off with the men in the church. There are righteous men of God. There absolutely are. They may be few and far between, but there are righteous men of God. So who's the teacher? Is it, is it the apostle? Is it the prophet? Is it the pastor? Is it the evangelist? Is it the teacher? Who, who is the teacher? John 14, 26, Jesus out of his own mouth said, but the comforter which is the, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. The Holy Ghost shall teach you all things. Everything you need to know is going to be taught to you by the Holy Ghost. Do you guys realize Peter, Paul, James, Matthew, John, it was their hand that did the writing. But the Bible said holy men of old were moved upon, overshadowed by the Holy Ghost. So that when they wrote, it was not the words of men coming across on that paper. It was the word of God coming, manifested through the mouths and the pens of holy men. Perfect men. 
perfect in the flesh, that's a confusing statement. I'm not even going there. Men that learn, I'll say it this way, men who learn how to every day walk in the spirit that they not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I'll say it that way. And the Holy Spirit moved upon those men who had learned that principle. And the word of God was given through men. But it wasn't men that was the teacher. It was God. His Holy Spirit teaches us all things. And His Holy Spirit will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever Jesus said unto you. Whatever Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is going to teach you what He meant and remind you of what He taught. So that when you're living life and Jesus taught something that you're not aware of, all of a sudden you go to prayer one day and the Spirit starts convicting you about something you didn't even know was wrong. What has happened? The Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit has moved upon you and taught you and brought to your remembrance what Jesus said. And so now you come into alignment with it. It makes sense. And that is the process of perfection. You guys following me? Who's the teacher? Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the teacher. John, John reiterated this in 1 John 2 and 27. He said, but the anointing, referring to the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, the anointing which you have received. Now, uh, uh, go, back to, go back to verse 20, 1 John 2 and 20. If you can throw it up on the screen real quick. Write it down in your study guide so you can look at it later. We need a new computer. The baby's slow. I know it ain't Brother Anthony's fault. I've been back there working on that thing lately. And you sitting there and wait, wheels spinning. But, but ye have an unction from the Holy One. Who's the Holy One? The Holy Spirit. You have an unction from the Holy One and ye know all things. Next verse. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no truth, and that no lie is of the truth. Next verse. I, I could say a lot about this, but I, I got to get to a certain point. Who is a liar? But he that denieth Jesus is the Christ. He is an antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Next verse. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you. If what the Holy Ghost taught you through us remains. That's the key. Most of what we teach doesn't remain. People hear it. People do it this morning. They'll hear this and they're like, oh yeah, perfection. And then three months later, you, you even thought about how can God perfect me today. That means the word did not remain in you. That's why we give study guides. So you can take the scriptures home in the next few days and few weeks. Continue to read and get that word in you that it abides in you. You got to hurry, 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 hurry. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. Next verse. And this is the promise that he hath promised unto us, even eternal life. The word brings eternal life. <sighs> Give me 27. I've, I've got to hurry. Ah, no, no, no I'm all, no, thank you for popping that up. That was God. Tw previous verse. Was it 26. That was a God thing. These things have I written unto you concerning them that there are people coming into the church is what John's writing about. They're coming into the church and they're telling you, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do that. You, you know what John and Peter and Paul wrote? That we have a more perfect understanding of God than what Peter, Paul, and John wrote. And, and John said, they're not the anointed ones. They're liars. They've not come in to perfect you. They've come in to seduce you. 
You know how to tell when somebody, the difference between somebody perfecting you and somebody seducing you? Somebody per- protecting you will warn you. They'll tell you straight up. They'll hurt your feelings. Somebody that's seducing you would never do anything. To ever step on your toes, they'll never preach on a divisive doctrine in their assemblies. Divisive doctrine. You're right, it's it's divisive. It divides the saved from the lost. The sheep from the goats. The wheat from the chaff. You better believe it divides. These things have I written unto, unto you concerning them that seduce you. Now give me verse 27. But the anointing which you have received, talking about the Holy Spirit, the Holy One, received of him, that you have received of him, abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. John said, why are you running after all these men that are telling concepts that are contrary to what the Holy Ghost taught you through us? Because if they're teaching something contrary than what we taught, the Holy Ghost is not teaching through one of us. God will not contradict himself. The anointing, John is saying the anointing was doing the teaching through us. And you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you all things, and that anointing is truth. If it doesn't convict you, it's not truth. If it's because the only work of God is to perfect you. If it always encourages, encourages, pats you on the back. Oh, you can keep on. Oh, you're going to get rich. You're going to get a car. And it pats you on the back. It's not of God. God came to perfect you. Perfection is going to require some conviction. Some purging. Some warning. Some rebuking. Some reproving. If that's not taking place, it's not of God. But I get chill bumps. When he preaches. The anointing teaches you all and is truth and there it is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Everybody good? Oh, this is so good. I would rob you if I didn't tell you. I want to give you this. I'm going to give you these principles. I'll do it as quickly as I can. Matthew 10 and 40, Jesus said, talking to his disciples, his 12, the apostles, he that receiveth you receives me. That's how the anointing works through flesh. He's saying when they hear you preach, They're not hearing you preach. They're hearing me preach. That is why so many people miss what goes on in church. It's because they're only viewing it as church. They're stuck on that level of understanding. And they look up and they say, well, you know, Pastor Jacques preached a good sermon today. Pastor Brantley preached a good sermon today. Elder Waldron preached a good sermon today. And we receive it as a man delivering a good sermon. But we missed what God was doing. God, it was more than just a man's sermon. Around here it is. I see a lot of foolishness going on in a lot of places. But in this pulpit, when somebody hits this pulpit, they've got a word from God. I realize that's going to catch a lot of flack. Well, you guys are the only ones that think you judge by the fruit. Judge by, judge by the fruit. Look at how many people in this church have grown spiritually, significantly spiritual. Listen, understand my motive behind saying this. That sat in other churches for years. 
and never grew in their relationship with God. Come here six months and if talking about I have never in all my days learned as much in six months. I had somebody say that this week. I don't say that to build us up because the whole point of this is it's not us preaching. It's the Holy Ghost. How else can you explain when you come to church and you've been praying and you've been going through something, one of us get up in the pulpit and we hit it dead on every single service, one right after the other. We address issue after issue after issue. You ask co-workers questions on the job. Question comes up. Come to church Wednesday night. That's exactly what we're preaching on. How else do you explain that than that is God speaking through flesh? It's not men teaching. It's the Holy Ghost teaching. Through men. Here, but the reason, go ahead, sit down, sit down. The reason most people miss it is because they don't even see it like that. They see it as, well, you know, they got some talented preachers over there. No. Does it make sense? Watch this. Jesus said, he that receiveth you receives me. Now here's the key. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Verse 41. Here's the key. He that receiveth a prophet. Now what does a prophet do? Perfects the church. Same principle applies to apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Their whole job is to perfect the church. Now notice what Jesus says. He that receiveth a prophet, but in a specific way. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet. He didn't just say, he that receiveth a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. He's, he that receiveth a prophet in the name or in the authority of a prophet. When that prophet starts speaking and you realize the authority that's upon him is not of him. The authority is of God. And when you receive that authority that God has put upon that prophet or apostle or pastor or teacher, then you receive the prophet in the name of the prophet. And that's the only way you receive the prophet's reward. You cannot receive from an apostle unless you receive him in the authority of an apostle. That's why most people miss it. We view it as a man up there giving a good sermon. If we would view it as the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, that God has put, God has put his own authority on that man in that hour. And I'm going to receive it as from God, not from a man, from God. Then you receive God's reward. Second Corinthians two seventeen. The, the apostles always running into this problem. Second Corinthians two seventeen. We, we'll just read it. For we, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. He's referring to other ministers. He said they'll get in there and take scriptures and twist them to make you feel good and seduce you. John said. Paul said we don't do that. We take the pure word of God and we preach the pure word of God. If it hurts your feelings, so be it. It's given not to comfort you, but perfect you. He said we don't mess with the word of God. We don't corrupt the word of God as many. But as of sincerity, but as of in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. 1 John 4 and 6. John said again, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God won't hear what we're saying. Interesting, isn't it? Hereby we know Paul's saying these preachers are coming in and they're telling the churches 
all these things that are contrary to what we've taught them. And, and John said, this is how you know if they're of God or not. If they're obeying us, if they're preaching what we're preaching, they're of God. If they refuse to hear what we preach, they're not of God. Hereby, we know who's operating in the spirit of truth and who's operating in the spirit of error. You know, are they obeying the whole counsel of God? Or are they just preaching bits and pieces that are comfortable for the people to hear? If that's the case, they're in the spirit of error. If they're preaching the whole council, perfecting the church, not seducing the church. If they're perfecting the church, they are of the spirit of truth. Make sense? 1 Corinthians 2.12 Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Again, that anointing was teaching through them. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. Paul said what we're delivering to you is not man's wisdom. It's not man's teaching. But what we're delivering unto you is that which the Holy Ghost teacheth. And we're comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, the carnal man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Well, I've been good, I've obeyed some commandments, but why is all this stuff going on in my life? Why are you still picking on me? Why are you still telling me there are things that need to change about my relationship with God? Why? Because we're purging you. natural man won't receive the purging he won't receive the correction he won't receive the reproof he won't receive the rebuke it's foolishness to him neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned you can't even know what's of God and what's of not if you ain't got the Holy Ghost they're spiritually discerned verse 15 and, and, and oh, thank you Jesus the reason, everybody noticed that most of these churches and denominations you go into, they tell you you can be saved without the Holy Ghost. Do you see the danger? Sure, the false prophet's going to tell you you can be saved without the Holy Ghost. Sure he is. Because the preaching of the word is spiritually discerned. And if you don't have the spirit, you can't discern if what he's saying is true or false. So sure, he wants to teach you that you don't have to be baptized with the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in other tongues. Because if you ever get that, you'll sit there at some point and the words that come out of his mouth will just grate on your spirit and God will t the, the anointing will teach you what you're hearing is not of God, it's of man. So sure, they want to teach that you can be saved without the Holy Ghost, but that's a lie from the pit of hell. He that, is, he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? Paul's saying, but we have the mind of Christ. Our mind is to perfect you, not seduce you. Does it make sense? Y'all are getting bored with me. I'm almost done. Galatians 5, 16. This is the key. This is the, the key to being perfect. If you can learn to do this, you can be perfect. Galatians 5, 16. Paul said, this I say then. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I, I don't have time to explain that. I've explained it for 11 hours almost in another series. Get it, listen to it. For the past couple of weeks, I've been sending the notes out to those of you that are on the email list so that you can read it and study it for yourself. We'll continue doing that through the season. And I may do it another, another couple of months down the road until we get this stuff in our hearts. Because if you can live according to those principles, you can be perfect. 
Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. That's a lie. Stand with me. Everybody say the spirit. That's the key. You can't teach without the anointing. If you teach, it's of man and not of God. It's the spirit of error and not of truth. But the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth, shall teach through you. You cannot be saved without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. How can you even receive spiritual teachings and you've not received the Holy Spirit? Most of it will be foolishness unto you. I mentioned a while ago that the, the denominal false church world works so hard to tell you you don't have to have the Holy Ghost. And there are many of us that are sitting here and, and hear me when I say this. I'm, my, my goal today, if I was here to rebuke you, I would plainly tell you I'm here to rebuke you. I'm not here to rebuke us. I'm here to reprove us. To reprove in its most simplest form is to prove again. That means you have developed some sort of mentality that you need to be proved that it's wrong. That's what reproved means. We have allowed that spirit that operates in the denominal world to, to quench the spirit, to keep it from moving, to, keep, to tell people they can be saved without the Holy Ghost. That's quenching the spirit. But we have some of that going on at Takeover. I want, close your eyes. I want everybody to close your eyes. I want your mind on yourself right now alone. Don't be thinking about anybody else but your relationship with God. You say, Pastor Brantley, how, how is there any quenching of the spirit that's going on at Takeover? This is how. When myself or Pastor Jacques give altar calls for people to come and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, many sit in their pew knowing they've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in other tongues. You know you don't have it. But yet we don't come and seek it when the opportunity is presented. In a case like that, don't answer out loud. And again, I'm not here to rebuke, I'm here to reprove. In a case like that, what have you done? You've quenched the Spirit of God. In that his spirit was reaching for you and he wanted you to be filled, yet you didn't step out. You've quenched the spirit of God. Why don't we step out? Is it because we're worried? You know, well, what happens if I go up there and a whole big group of people gets around and and they're all looking at me and I'm crying and snot's coming out of my nose and I look foolish when I'm speaking in tongues I just I'd rather not get it that way I'll get it at home when nobody else is around pray tell me what you think that motive is it's nothing more than pride and if pride is keeping you from seeking diligently to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Understand pride. God hates pride. He resists the proud. But to those who will humble themselves, He gives His grace. Does it make sense? Do we realize what we've been doing? Here's, here, plainly, here's what you need to do. If, if you are here and you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in other tongues and I've talked to some of you this week more than one about this very issue don't feel like I'm trying to point you out in front of church today okay because ain't nobody in here but me and you knows we even had the conversation and I wouldn't even address it publicly except there's a whole group of other people doing the same thing what you need to do is every time you go to prayer, your number one goal 
ought to be to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Before you pray for anything else in your life, there is nothing, nothing more important than you receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Every time you pray, you ought to be praying for God to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Every time you come to church and the altar is open for people to pray, every time you have nothing greater to do than to seek for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now some are thinking, well, what if I go up there and I don't get it? Then join the crowd. I didn't get it the first time I prayed for it. I would dare say over 90% of people in this building didn't get it the first time they prayed for it. But they sought diligently until they prayed through and they let nothing deter them from seeking. Don't ever waste an opportunity to seek for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That is the principal thing. There is nothing more important than that. You can't be saved without it. You can't be truly fed the Word of God without it. You can't can't walk in the Spirit to not fulfill the lust. You can't be perfected without it. It's the principal thing. I say these things to encourage you. You need to develop a discipline in your spirit from right now forward. Every opportunity I have to seek God, I'm going to do it. I will not let any opportunity ever escape me again to pray for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Having said those things, it is not a difficult thing to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. All it takes is faith to believe God is going to fill me with the Holy Ghost right now. If you can can choose to believe that, you can come to this altar right now and I lay hands on you and in a matter of seconds, you'll start speaking in other tongues. All it takes is faith and obedience. Faith will produce the Spirit, will begin to move on your life and you'll feel it. Then you've got to obey that unction and begin to speak with your mouth the words that God has put in your mind, the syllables that God has put in your mind. No matter how foolish, no matter how childish it seems, you've got to obey that unction and just let it flow. And once you let it flow, it's going to like a river. It'll come out of you. A new language spoke by the Holy Ghost through you. But you've got to let it happen. Faith and obedience, that's all it takes. Come on, let's pray. Those of you that need the Holy Ghost, let's pray.